for and this I'm Mark Waite. Uh, we're recording. This is a Google Summer of Code office hours session for the Jenkins Git plugin. Thanks very much for being here. Uh, what we'll start with is we want the bulk of this session to be question and answer. We want it to, you ask a question, I'll give an answer, or I'll de declare that I don't know the answer, and that's okay too. Uh, but we'll do mostly question and answer. Um, be, before we get to the question and answer, what we'll do is we will, we will first, each of us will introduce themselves, uh, where you're from, uh, name, et cetera, um, where you are at in school, those things, so that we get to know each other. Then I will do a brief overview of the two project ideas. Uh, those are not the only things that could be project plans, but those are the two that I had in mind. And then we can talk about, um, about questions that you have. Huh. So let's, let's go first. Yeah. I'm, I'm Mark Waite. Uh, I am, a, let's see, a Jenkins contributor. I maintain the Git plugin and the Git client plugin and have done so for a number of years. Uh, so you understand my sort of biases. Uh, I started maintaining the Git plugin because I felt a little grumpy about other people breaking the Git plugin with their changes. And so the, the way I got involved was I started writing a bunch of tests and I wrote a bunch of tests and submitted pull requests, wrote a bunch of tests and submitted more pull requests. And the current maintainer said, hey, you know, we're kind of tired of this. Should we just make him a maintainer? And they did. And so I became a maintainer. And as I kept maintaining, they sort of faded into the background to do other things till it became that I was the primary maintainer. And yes, I'm still fixated on tests. I still care very deeply about not breaking things. And that means that, that I will bias towards actually not taking changes rather than taking changes that don't have tests. Uh, mm -hmm. If a, a change is proposed and it has no tests, I'm very likely, unless it's a very compelling change, I'm unlikely to write the test myself because I expect an author to write the tests as part of their exercise of writing. Uh, I'm a, I've spent some years in programming, but I spent about 20, 20, 25 years managing. So I'm also imperfect and still learning about programming. So don't be surprised if you learn something and I learn something in the interaction. It's perfectly fine. Uh, we've, we've shaken our heads. I've shaken my head personally in dismay with some things that, for instance, Rishab had submitted something and I realized, oh, this is a long time bug that I had left in the tests that I had not fixed. And it's really embarrassing, but I'm going to be embarrassed and just admit I made a mistake. So, uh, let's go ahead. Why don't we have, uh, Rishab, do you want to introduce yourself next? Uh oh. Your video's off, and I don't have a microphone for you. So, well, so let's go. Um, and I don't know how to pronounce your names. Yash? Yeah, you're right. You're correct. Yeah. Go ahead. Could yeah. you could yeah. do the next, please? Uh, so, um, my, so my name is Yash Jain, and currently I'm pursuing my master's at San Diego State University. And I'm from uh, India, but currently I'm in San Diego, U.S., so, uh, so, so you usually I got asked why did I decide to pursue masters? Uh, so uh, I was looking to uh, increase my knowledge set. So yeah, I came here to and to get a new different set of new challenges. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, it's been good till now. Staying, uh, it's been six months for me in the U.S. right now. So uh, yeah, I've got a lot of new challenges that I didn't face back in India. Wow, that was like six months of a, a complete uh, roller coaster, I would say, for me. So, yeah, that's all about me. Uh -huh. Thank you, Yash. Thanks very much. And, and that's great. I understand the weather in San Diego is pretty much perfect all the time. I have colleagues who live in San Diego, and it's, it's, it's spectacular. Good choice. Excellent location. Yeah. Uh, Sumit, would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, um, so uh, I'm Sumit. Uh, I'm currently pursuing a bachelor's in, uh, in control engineering uh, in New Delhi. So uh, like my, my degree is in control engineering, but I realized my interest was in uh, computer programming. So I took a lot of electives and uh, I will try to build my path towards, you know, computer programming and uh, did internships. And so slowly, slowly, I've, uh, I think, been able to 
make that shift. Uh, uh, I have started contributing to Jenkins since I think December. Uh, a few of my uh, changes were in Jenkins core mostly. So, and I've, lo- I've loved the community so far. The community is absolutely amazing. Everybody is so welcoming. And and I really liked your uh, story about Git plugin, like how you started contributing. It was really nice. Loved it. Excellent. Thank you. Well, so so you and I have a shared shared history in one part then. My degree is actually in mechanical engineering. And as I was graduating from the university, recruiting, I had to tell the recruiter I had no desire to do mechanical engineering. I wanted to be play with computers for the rest of my life. And it turned out that that company wanted someone who wanted to play with computers with a degree in mechanical engineering. So a degree in control engineering is a good choice. There are lots of places we do software. Rishab, do you want to go next? Hey, yeah, what is happening? I, I, I'm sorry, I left the meeting because of the internet connection issue. So we're, we're doing introductions. I just logged in. Tell us, t- we're doing introductions. Okay. Tell us your name, tell us your background, where you are in school, where you're physically located, uh, and some of your yes. interests. So uh, I'm Rishabh Budhalia, and uh, I've been studying uh, computer science engineering. Uh, basically, it's a dual degree, computer science engineering and MBA, uh, a five-year course. Uh, in Thapar Institute of uh, Engineering and Technology. It's in Patiala, India. Right now, I'm based in Noida, uh, where I just completed my internship recently uh, in a big data analytics company. So uh, my interest. So uh, I started open source contribution uh, at the company where I was interning. I was not uh, aware about open source contribution. I always thought that whatever contributions we made were uh, either uh, a client request for the company or for the benefit of the company's uh, software. But uh, as one of the mentors I had in the company motivated me to, uh, one, one of the features we had in-house to, uh, to contribute it to the open source software we are using as well, so that, was, that was really the moment where I started to understand uh, the benefit, how my, uh, the abilities of the, the way I coded, it, it changed drastically because I uh, kind of learned how to, uh, the, how the open source community helps you to improve your, uh, the, the way you code and the, the style of coding and everything. So that, that was, that was the point I started open source contribution. Then I started, uh, I think I started uh, around, in February, I started contributing to Jenkins in the Git plugin and Git client plugin, started associating with you. And I, um, I have been working and I've been really, I've been really impressed with the commun- Jenkins community and the way they, they've been teaching me, the way you've been helping me and contributing to, these, to, this, uh, to this company. Yeah. Great, thank you, thanks very much. All right, so let's, I think the next topic then should be, let's do a quick review of the, the project ideas. There are two, and I'm gonna share my screen for this because I think it, it may help us just to, to remind me and remind everybody, okay, here are the things that we had in mind. So let me find Google Summer of Code and I'll bring it onto my screen and then share my screen. Uh, one of, while I'm getting that brought up, uh, one of the reminders that Oleg Nanashev suggested to me was to remind that be sure that all student submissions make assure that they have used all of the provide all the sections that are mandated by the Google Summer of Code outline. Be sure you're very careful as you're preparing your proposals. Um, And Rishab, I haven't reviewed your proposal yet to look for that specifically, but I will be looking for it specifically within the next one or two days. But be sure it includes all the sections because they expect Every section is there that you've read the details and that you've followed the, the description rigorously. So, so don't, okay. don't miss the opportunity to use those hints. And as a reviewer, this is my first year doing men, being a mentor. So I will tend to make mistakes as well. So you'll have to watch for yourself to, to assure that your proposal is in as good a condition as possible as you're getting it ready. Okay, so okay, although sh- I did follow the guidelines, but I double check the proposal. Yeah. Excellent. And that's 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 what I would hope. That's that's great to hear. So I'm going to share my screen now. And here we go. Okay, so the two the two uh, project ideas that I had offered 
were Git plugin performance improvements and Git repository caching on agents. Let's look at plugin performance improvements first. So here the idea is that the, the Git plugin has, or the Git client plugin, has two implementations inside of it. One that uses command line Git and one that uses a Java-based implementation of Git. Command line Git must be invoked from Java by forking a new process, by creating a new process, starting that process, communicating with that process and getting its information back. And on Windows especially, there have been times in the past at least where that the cost of starting a process and running it has been quite a bit higher than the cost of starting and running a process on Linux. So my thought was there may be real benefits just to on some of the things where the, the cost of the call to the command line Git is overshadowed by the cost of starting the process, JGit might be faster. And so the idea was take the Java micro benchmark harness and use it to test comparing the command line Git implementation and the JGit implementation. Now, in addition to that, there's one big glaring known issue, which is that we've got a case where we do two fetch calls when it should be sufficient to do one call to get fetch. And so that was, that was the first example, but this is not quite micro benchmarking. This is just, there's an optimization thing that needs to be done here. And then the, the, the other talks about performance comparison using, using JMH uh, and some quick start ideas, some newbie friendly issues that are available and who we are. So before we do any questions, I wanted to, well, may, maybe the best is, do we want to, are there questions on this one specifically that you'd like to ask and we should discuss before we go to the next set of questions? I actually, I have some questions, but they are related to the proposal I've proposed, the solutions and the implementations. Would you like to discuss that right now? But I think it's going to be a, I don't know, maybe a 10 minute or maybe a 15 minute discussion. So I don't want to overshadow other people. I so don't want to take the time too much. That, and that's a fair question. I think I would like to get to your questions, Rishab, but I, I mm -hmm. would offer rather let's, Let's look at high level, before we talk about specific details, we will get to your questions, absolutely. I think that's the right thing to do for this session. Um, okay. But implementation details, I wasn't sure we should do here before I review the other one. Okay, sure. Okay, so Yash, no questions from you in terms of, of this particular topic? No. Uh, okay. Yeah. Okay, great. All right. Well, so then, then let me do the sec the next overview, and then we'll then we'll do open questions on both of them. So, Git repository caching on agents is is looking at the the realization that a single workspace on a Jenkins agent is probably mostly a copy of other workspaces that are on the same agent particularly multi-branch plugins, for instance, where we use a multi-branch plugin to test the, or the multi-branch jobs to test the Jenkins Git plugin. So the master branch, the stable, stable 3.x branch, and every pull request are all derived from the same basic repository. And cloning that full copy of the repository for every workspace seems like it's wasteful and there are things that we might do to avoid a full clone of every t every time we need it because there are probably existing copies of that repository somewhere on that disk already that we could use as a reference repository and when git uses a reference repository a reference repository allows the local copy to be updated from local objects instead of always copying the objects over the network from the remote so there's a, a pull request that was proposed a few years ago, pull request 502, which offers one, one variant of this, but I think there are several different ways this could, be, this could be done. It could be done by 
for instance, following, following a technique where we cache things always to the local agent in some central cache. It could be done by looking on the local agent for through an index of repositories that are in workspaces trying to find an existing workspace. There are several different ways this one could be done where your, your ideas are welcomed and encouraged. All right, so we've finished the, we've finished the introductions. Now I would propose, let's go with questions on the, on the projects or questions on your, your questions. Yes, would you like to go first? Yes, yeah, sure. Okay. I, I, um, okay. And I'm going to stop sharing so that we can see each other. Go ahead, Yash. Uh, so, after going through and doing a bit of analysis on the code base and checking out the Mercurial plugin, so what I see over there has been done is using a master cache uh, on the master agent and using that as a mechanism to update all the local copies. Okay, so I was, uh, I was thinking, uh, if we have a reference repository, uh, like the clone feature, would, uh, would there be overlap on both of these? If we, like, would there, would there be a sort of overlap between these two functionalities of using uh, reference, uh, the reference repository in advanced clone behavior and using, having this functionality as well? Well, so uh, do you see any overlap, overlap happening? There, there certainly is overlap potential, and the, 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 those are two very good concepts. So, the Mercurial plugin, I, I love its its concept. The, the person who wrote it is brilliant. Jesse Glick's work on it is is absolutely brilliant. Uh, so, what what the concept that came to me was if if we if we use the cache on the master and copied to the agent the agent and the master distance is probably much shorter. They're probably mm -hmm. much nearer than the agent to the Git repository, right? Than to the central Git repo. So there's benefit there. However, the, the copy from master to agent is probably still not, not as fast as copy on the local disk of the agent. So the thought I had was, okay, we might use copy from master to agent, as, as the beginning, prime it, prime the cache by going from master to agent. We then got to ask the remote repository, okay, give me the real objects and that will, that will populate them. So that would be one approach, would be master to agent and then go ask the remote repository to give us the latest objects. So, the, the, so in case if we have like 15 jobs on, this, on the same machine, then we'll be requesting like uh, 15 different uh, uh, different remote requests would be going into the uh, uh, into our remote repo. repo. Uh, instead, I was uh, I was more keen on going to the mouse uh, how the Mercurial have done it using like taking uh, uh, updating the master first. Uh, uh, like uh, uh, if if we see a request that uh, that is making a uh, that is making a uh, uh, that is making um, that has changes and uh, needs a copy, new copy. So it would update the master cache first, then use the local, uh, update the local cache parallelly, and then use it from there. So mm -hmm. then all the all the local uh, all the local agents that have the that cache m would have been updated. So the rest of the fourteen jobs can use that cache instead of making another request. So uh, so I was wondering if there would be any concurrency issues uh, hidden behind that I'm not able to visualize or maybe like upon, think upon? I, I, I like the way you're thinking. So that's, let, let me see if I can say it back to you to be sure that I've understood it. So I think your, your vision was, if there are many jobs running on an agent, mm -hmm. they would each make a request to the central cast, to the master saying, mm -hmm. I want this repository. They know they and they would tell the master, I want this repository that is this location, but they're actually asking the master. The master then performs the request to the, the actual remote repository and then delivers the to the many requesters um, that are out. Yeah, that that seems 
that seems viable. You would then have a single reader from the master to the remote repository that populates the cache on the master and many, many readers to the agents. And, and since there's only one real repository, master repository off on GitHub or Bitbucket, uh, mm -hmm. that seems like a very reasonable way to, to consider approaching it. But I was just uh, hoping that this doesn't break the underlying architecture because uh, uh, if we see uh, how the uh, reference reference repository has been used, like in the existing advanced clone behavior, we already have a functionality of giving a reference repository on every on every agent. So I was hoping it doesn't break this, or some way it might break it, or it would be an overlap maybe somewhere. I, I don't think it would break it because the reference repository concept is built right into Git. And so Git itself does, does those reference repositories. We're just using a facility that Git already has. Now, it may, not, it may not give you the maximum disk savings or the maximum data transfer savings if you don't use a reference repository on the agent. So, so the, 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 the one to one to many that you, you described where Git repository to master was one, one chain of, of request. Mm -hmm. And then many requests to the agent will tend to copy all of the objects many times to the agent. You could consider one to one to one to many, where you say, I'm going to go from master from Git repository to master, one request, master to agent, cache repository, one request, and then then spread that use have those agent jobs use a reference repository on the agent mm -hmm. yeah yeah uh, so but and and that then is using what that's doing is that's even further minimizing the the amount of data stored on the local agent and the amount of network traffic between the master and the agent mm -hmm. now i don't know if i i don't know at what point we'd you'd say wow that's that's too complicated i'm not going to bother with something that complicated because there your your concern about concurrency issues is a valid concern pr 502 one of its blocking points was that when i did interactive testing with it it had concurrency issues that i did not know how to solve all i saw was i saw that it had concurrency problems and those concurrency problems were serious enough that i would not release it to production and and that was just me, and I'm I'm okay. I I know how to stress the thing, but I am certainly not a thousand people using it. I I was just one person running a set of tests, and I was able to show concurrency problems in that PR just by my testing. Um, so I was wondering if uh, like uh, mm, what would be a good proposal? Because uh laying out this uh, architecture of having one to uh yeah, like from uh remote to master to master to agent then agent to other pe agent to other job instances and other agents on the parallel running on the uh running on the level of uh, that particular agent so giving out the architecture uh giving out the architecture or writing some uh temporary co like code be like uh, using some uh, sort of coding uh, mechanism to display what you are trying to achieve what, what so, we go do, yeah. so for me architecturally this one might fit with the the git plugin has a way of checking for checking for updates on the on the the central repository on the github or bitbucket repository it uses git ls remote remote naturally as its technique to check it or it will check with a local workspace that method call might be exactly because and that thing happens on the master not on the agents so that method call might be the exact place to start with a small prototype that says if i detect a change i'm going to pull that change into a local cache on the master uh, that that might be one one approach to say okay get ls remote is the command and find the places where git ls remote is called where it's where a, a remote list is done the other matching architectural concept is that multi-branch pipeline in the git plugin already has a concept of caches on the master 
-hmm. And so between yeah. LS remote and caches on the master that are already there, it may be that you'd say, okay, every time the master asks LS remote, it should consider, does it need to pull down more, more change, pull down the recent, recent changes instead of just doing an LS remote? That might yeah. be one approach. Say, okay, somebody pulled the remote and odd ah, changes were detected, bring them in. Yeah. Uh, so we, uh, we need to, uh, then we need to communicate that change right now that we don't have to the agent level. Or because the jobs are defined centrally at the map, because the, the master invokes all of the tasks on agents, I would suspect what you would want to do is consider um, asking or knowing where the caches are on the master and telling the agent, ask this location on the master for a clone first. So mm -hmm. when, when you're about to, when, when, the, when the master is about to send a, a, a request to the agent, which says, go perform this fetch, the first thing would be go perform this fetch, but instead of fetching from the actual central repository, fetch okay. from the master. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 I had in my mind was, uh, yeah, uh, uh, using a, a ref, uh, like uh, how do we decide since if a master has a, a initial copy that was made as a shallow, fa shallow fa fetch, so, uh, some, uh, uh, would would that be would that cause any issue uh, down the line? Or Good. So the master caches, the master caches. If we would want to safety check that the master caches are in fact full copies. Yeah. Right. Because we don't want a narrow ref spec. Uh, yeah. We don't want a shallow clone. Uh, it's not a checkout, so we don't have to worry about sparse checkout. But it, it should. If it's if it's shallow, then one of the actions should probably be deep in it, right? Switch yeah. it from being shallow to not shallow. And if it's if it's using a narrow ref spec, we probably should on the master admit we're going to widen the ref spec, even if the user specified a narrow ref spec. Okay. Uh, so another approach that I had in my mind was to uh, make a uh, make a bare repository. Uh, on a given uh, location or a uh, location given by the user that would be used as a single source of uh, references for any uh, any operation to be performed instead like that would be that wouldn't have um uh, that would override the ch a sparse checkout uh, shallow copy whatever the user had requested uh, and that would clone the complete repository on the ma on the master at a particular given location by the user and uh, all the agents and everybody would uh, know that this would always be the single point of source where they can pull to get the updates instead of having it uh, modules, um, having it defined, having it uh, randomly or maybe generated somewhere on the workspace directly of the, of the master. Like, and, and that's, that's certainly also However, I believe, and I could be wrong on this, because the, that, that section of the code was actually implemented by Stephen Connolly uh, mm -hmm. with inputs from Jesse Glick. So I'm not as fluent in the, in the multi-branch code as I'd like to be. But mm -hmm. my, I think what you're describing is only a slight variation on the caches that are already in the Git plugin from on the, sitting on the master. So all you're doing, what you just described, would you just be changing the storage location of those caches that are already there. So I'm not sure that that'll give you the gain that you're hoping for. Uh, it's just altering what's the name of the cache directory. Um, if, of course, I, I had this in mind to avoid the uh, shallow and uh, fast checkout, but okay, yeah. Right. And, and, and that, that's a, your, your point is valid. And you may want to put that into the plan saying, Hey, the, the intent is safety check that the cached copies are not shallow and not, not, uh, let's see, not shallow, not, um, 
narrow ref spec. And, and if it turns out that you, you confirm that, oh, the depth and or the ref spec is under user control, you may have to then say, I've got to create a new cache concept. I've got to have a new cache on the master, which is not under user control. They don't get to narrow the ref spec. They don't get to make it shallow. And, and then your idea of ask the user, where shall I put it? You could also on the, alternatively just say, I'm going to create a new one, a new cache, give it a new directory name on the Jenkins master. Okay. So, so we have one level of check over here that first makes a check uh, if we have a narrow, narrow ref spec or something. And uh, so, yeah, that makes sense. Maybe I'm done. That would be that's all for me. Okay, Rishabh. Uh, I have a question related to th this discussion. Uh, when you said, Mark, that uh, we could have a different cache which the user doesn't uh, know about, uh, wouldn't that create problems for the users who have large repositories? Because the cache would be growing bigger and they would not know what is occupying uh, their disk space. And if we are not able to maintain it, uh, I am not sure how we maintain our cache. But if you're not if you're not maintaining it optimally, then it would probably uh, be an issue of over exercising of disk space for the user. Or is that is that a wrong assumption? No, your assumption is valid. Your, your, it's actually, it certainly is a valid concern. A Jenkins master is quite commonly a, a large consumer of disk space. And that, that's an accepted, accepted reality. Now, if, if let's take the example of, I had with a previous employer where we didn't, we didn't like it, we weren't terribly proud of it, but we had a Git repository that was 20 gigabytes. And okay. a 20 gigabyte Git repository mattered a lot where we put that thing, right? It was, and, mm -hmm. and we, we had to make sure we never, we never cloned it anything other than shallow. We never did anything but use a narrow ref spec. Uh, and mm -hmm. and it, it created all sorts of limitations on us for disk space. So yes, we do have to be aware that, uh, as an example, the, the testing, the test, the base test repository for the the repository caching should probably be the linux kernel it's an excellent okay, choice yeah, and it starts at a gigabyte that's that's and yeah. it's got great history you figure linus when he created git created it so he could do git work so he could do kernel work and therefore the yeah. history in the linux kernel and it's got one of the highest volumes of change of any project anywhere in the world so the, the Linux kernel is the poster child of, of big, big repositories with lots and lots of commits. And so, yes, it's, a, it's an excellent choice. And it reminds us that it's not unreasonable to have a one or two gigabyte repository that is maintained by people who are very serious about using Git. Now, the, the 20 gig repository that I had, we were, we were actually not serious about using Git. We had people who are checking large binaries into it. But Linus does not typically check large binaries into that repository. The Linux kernel is big just because it's got a lot of changes. OK. So uh, I would like to share my screen to discuss the implementation I want to. Is that OK with everyone? Yes, please. Go ahead. Uh, so the first thing I would like to discuss Oh, one second. Um, I'm not sure why it's hanging. Yeah. So uh, the first question is that uh, what if tried with benchmarking is that I want to give it as an option, as an additional behavior to the Git plugin user. And the rationale behind uh, this decision is that uh, Git plugin and Git, plug Git client plugin, they, bo they both have a very broad audience. And uh, whatever performance changes we're doing because of the study, we'll, because of the tests we'll have, performance tests we'll have, I don't want, uh, possibly we cannot 
get, uh, create test cases for every kind of use case the users will have because since of course because we have a broad audience so what i what i thought was that initially we could have it as an additional behavior and here i've created an implementation and there's this prototype and after maybe a release or two once we know that from the user feedback that what we think like if replacing git with uh, git cli git with jkit is actually giving them a considerable boost in performance then maybe we could shift it from an additional behavior to something which is happening uh, inside and they don't they don't know about it as, as a mandatory feature although it makes sense that performance improvement should be should not be a concern for the user but uh, what i thought was since this this is a gsoc project with 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 a person and i am implementing the changes who doesn't have a considerable experience with these plugins i would i would want to have a safe uh, it as a safe feature first and then maybe consolidate it after having some user feedback i'm not sure if this is the right approach so that, the, that you yeah. you describe brilliantly the conservative approach that i've taken i don't like introducing new features without an escape hatch there must be a way to get out of the thing if i've made a, some mistake in the implementation and with yeah. a way to understand this is very good there are also techniques in the community that can could allow us to gather data from users if you're interested in that there are ways to to actually allow us to do telemetry where that they could optionally report back to us for a fixed period on their experience automatically so so your yeah, technique would, is not only good it's that. very very well suited okay so would you uh, i would just um, briefly explain what how i'm i'm going to implement the addition yes. behavior mm -hmm. so so it's going to be an git git scm extension uh, a class an implementation which will be called performance improvement option what it will basically do is it will decorate the environment variable the the environment global environment variable we'll have it will basically add one flag of git performance flag boolean flag so if a, a user chooses to enable performance wherever we have modified the code uh, through the results of our benchmarking study wherever we have modified the code we will we will have checks if this flag is true we'll basically uh, implement the implement our i will select the implementation which is performing better according to us and if if the boolean says no then we'll 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 use the default code path so it's 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 basically how every decorate function works and then i've just showed how i've just showed short four steps how i'm implementing and i'm sure when once you review the proposal you'll uh, you'll you'll see the implementation more so uh, would do you think this is the right way to do it or uh, would you would you have some concerns or criticism regarding this approach i think this is a fine way to do it i'm not sure i would use an environment variable because the mere existence of existence of the decorator in this case is already a flag you probably i mean if you look i believe there are other other decorators available already implemented like wipe workspace or like yes. uh shallow clone which they they don't use an environment variable to record the state of the decorator the true or falseness of it they just use an internal variable is there a is there was there something specifically that was motivating you to use the environment variable is that you want it available to the user inside the workspace when they're running the shell or tell me more about the environment variable choice okay i think it was the first thing which came into my mind i thought this is the easiest thing to do that i would because I, I i think i thought that uh, in this variable will be shared everywhere and i would not have issues where i would of course if i have an internal variable as the easiest thing to do because that would be shared everywhere so i uh, wouldn't have that problem but uh, when at the time when i was thinking about the solution i thought that this in we i can actually the environment variable everywhere so wherever i need to uh, create a check to uh, if selectively implement jgit or git i would just access the environment variable and put and check the flag to ah, ah okay so it's i see so it's a way of of transmitting that state without making every without making every place that references it aware of the specific extension 
Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. That, that's... And I, I'm not sure that that the the code you you insert then will be any less aware of of Git performance flag than it is it would be of any of an internal variable. So a, a very a meth a field on the class. So the the extension could just yeah. as easily. Yeah. I mean, either way, every time you want to ask a question of the extension, you're going to have to see is the extension there. And so I think yeah, sure. I think yeah. the the overhead for you will be about the same. In this case, you're storing it in a way that it does have the benefit that inside the shell steps of a pipeline or inside the 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 job steps of a freestyle job this environment variable would be available and they could see if if it was changing from using jgit to git back and forth so so there is there is some communication with the user benefit by use, choosing to use an environment variable i'm not sure that yeah, I, it's, I'm not sure that's healthy because we may not want the user to actually know which one we're doing. We may want to hide that from them, but but oftentimes I've made the mistake of thinking I should hide things from the users and then later coming back and demanding that I make them visible. Okay, so uh, so would you recommend using an internal variable instead of using this approach, using an I, environment variable? I think my personal tendency would have been to use an internal variable inside the decorator instead of an environment variable because I, my first thought was toward not towards telling the user about it, but rather just being sure the code can get to it easily. Sure, sure. Because so then it's a, then... A, a getter and a setter on the decorator. Okay, so I, I can change the implementation accordingly then. Yeah, now, now okay. uh, and again, this is, I don't know that if you've already done testing and already assured, you'll, you'll, you'll get a much better answer during implementation phase than I could offer right now because I'm just offering my guess, right? You'll, yeah, during, that's, that's, that's fair. So it's, this is a plan does not require that you have the code, if I understand correctly, a plan does not require that you're proposing final code. It's rather you're proposing yes. steps. And this is a proof that you've thought carefully about these steps and you've thought enough to realize, mm -hmm. oh, I could do it this way or this way. And it doesn't, yeah. it doesn't have to be one thing or the other. It's that rather, here's, here are my proposed steps. Okay, okay, okay. That's, that's good. Okay, the second thing uh, I would like to ask is, I think, I guess, once you read the proposal, it'll be better because uh, I, I performed a performance benchmarking on git fetch and I'm not sure if the results I'm getting are correct. I'm seeing change. I, I've seen, uh, I used a 320 MB repository for git fetch and I compared CLI git with uh, jgit and I have seen a one min, more than one minute difference in execution time. Is that, is that correct? Is that possible? It's, it is quite believable. So, so uh, considering the investment that is made in the code that is Git, that is Git and and JGit, um, the community behind Git is dramatically larger than the community behind JGit. There's there's just no 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 kidding ourselves that they are not very different sized communities. The community that is behind Git includes people who have who have worked on Linux file systems and have worked on, on at the kernel level for a very long time. And therefore they tend to choose things and Linus chose things in initial implementation that were in fact very, very well tuned to the Linux file system. So if command line Git is dramatically faster than JGit, I am not the least surprised, particularly on large repositories. Now, if it's the other direction where you find, oh, on large repositories, JGit is significantly faster than command line Git. That is a very interesting result that I got to wonder, oh, why? What, what would motivate that? Because the people who do work on Git are so, so committed to fast. It's, it's very, very hard okay. to write a second implementation that's better than, than what the Git implementers did. Sure, so I, I did find one observation which was interesting to me when, when I was performing this Git fetch. 
so for repository size which are very low i have a 34 kb repository uh, jgit was performing better than git in terms of average execution time uh, and for a 4 mb repository as well i i saw that jgit was performing better than git but then i was uh, since this was kind of an anomalous behavior i wanted to check if this is if this finding is right or not so what i did i was i was a little app comprehensive of the fact that since we are uh, use uh, the J JMH framework uh, applies uh, JVM bombing before they run the performance benchmark, so I was I was a little uh, I had a doubt that if the warm up session is actually uh, giving JGit this boost of performance. So what I did was to check if this to confirm if this was the right behavior. Uh, I I tried a different mode of performance benchmark benchmarking, which is called a cold start. performance benchmarking which basically means that i don't uh, warm up the jvm enough i i actually don't warm up i just start i just start uh, counting the ex- execution time uh, right from the uh, the test i've written uh, the git fetch and i i actually found that uh, jgit was then slower when there was no warm up jgit was not faster so then i was a little confused so uh, so i i could only understand that if the if the jvm is sufficiently warm up warmed up when i'm using jgit then only jgit can perform faster than git under the condition that the repository is maybe below 5 mb or probably in the size of kbs or maybe 1 or 2 mb i'm not sure i haven't tested it that much but uh, but that is what i found out but if the jvm is not warmed up then jgit is not performing better than git and uh, and uh, i am not sure right now currently how would i get to know if the jvm in the real code how would i get to know if the jvm is warmed i would assume the jvm is warmed up when i reach to the uh, git fetch part so basically Absolutely. i think it's a fair assumption to assume that jgit would perform better than git under a certain size of repository so, so they would they, yeah what what you just described is exactly the kind of sensitivity analysis that that i was hoping for in this and and what you described aligns very well with what i what i assumed would be the result because what 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 happens in your test was let's see there's a cost to fork a new process the cost to fork a new process is relatively constant and on small repositories it may actually dominate the the cost of the the operation now you used an operation which is a network operation so it it introduces the network variability and the network mm-hmm. slowdown in addition so so and yet still you saw that the the cost of the fork and the cost of communicating between processes was a significant portion of the total cost up to a certain threshold now for me that may lobby that that we would consider in choosing these tune ups to to use some form of local estimate of the size of the remote repository and yeah i was also thinking about that i don't know how you would do that local estimate of of sizes but there there it seems like if you've got a local copy somewhere in a cache there's an easy estimate or if you've got you could use heuristics about hey if well yeah you 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 can imagine all sorts of guesses as to how big is the remote repository to tune which yeah. which implementation should i use should i use yeah so that that might be a feature we could implement to actually check the size and then uh, implement the performance it it just cannot be just an in- environmental variable check there it has to be more checks to actually uh, enable the implementation which would perform better I I think so, so well and and now yeah. you did not mention anything about platform as a variable here and I would assume that platform sure. should be included as one of the variables that you check for sensitivity I I agree actually uh, yeah sorry I I could check it for I did check it for two platforms it was uh, my mac os my local system and one ec2 machine which was a linux instance I could not do it in a Windows. I I I probably will before I submit it. I I maybe I'll I'll add one more I, test study where I. I don't I don't think you need to do it even before you submit. Just put it into your plan that the plan will do it, yeah. and let me offer two more platforms that you should consider 
as part of your plan. IBM so I, series, I IBM series 390, yeah. so IBM mainframe, okay. and so. IBM IBM Power PC 64, and maybe a fourth okay. is ARM 64. And the reason okay. I'm offering those is they are three different places where the Jenkins platform special interest group is right now looking at adding adding support. Oh, okay. So and and they have very different characteristics. The IBM mainframe is a completely different way of of looking at things, actually. And so this very interesting in terms of, oh, I'm on a or or ARM sixty four is my Raspberry Pi, and yeah, and therefore sure. its file system has a completely different behavior than the file systems you have on your Mac, for instance. So we won't run Jenkins on a Raspberry Pi. I I run Jenkins agents on a Raspberry Pi all the time. Absolutely. And how, I don't understand that. Uh, why? Why would you do that? Oh, because if I if I need to evaluate tests or code that I'm intending to target to a Raspberry Pi, uh, the best way to do it is run the agent on a Raspberry Pi and and run the tests right on the Pi. Okay. Okay. So, so I, I will add these platforms in my proposal. Yeah. So I. Someone, someone I know, my, my son actually works for a robotics company, and they use okay. they use this device. A uh, it's a uh, an Nvidia Jetson, which is an embedded device with a GPU on the board, and okay. and I can see very much putting a Jenkins agent on this device. Would would you do that? Oh yeah, I I fully intend to that one. I, I I haven't hooked that one in, but I've got several Raspberry Pis already running. Okay, I, I didn't know about that. Okay, so That's a so new one for me as well. <laughs> well, and and but you're on the right track, right? You're you're doing exactly the right thing and thinking about what are the what are the axes of performance evaluation, and what is the sensitivity along that axis, and repository size is clearly one. Um, the yeah architecture or the the operating system of the computer seems like another one particularly with windows where the the cost to fork a process at least at one time was much higher on windows than it was on linux okay yeah and i, I think i have uh, apart from platform and size of repository i have also uh, would the jvm param uh, parameters uh, affect the performance of jgit or that's that's a very good insight it they certainly could i had not thought of that and i think that's that's a valid thing to check i know that the cloudy okay. support team has published mm -hmm. recommended guidelines based on their experience of what the best jvm settings are <clears throat> for the jenkins master so jvm parameters is a very good um, item to evaluate Okay, I, I have added that as well. Okay, and uh, the next question I had was, um, okay, uh, the git double fetch issue, which is another performance issue we have, known performance issue. Uh, the fix I provided was basically a flag which kind of avoided uh, the second fetch. Would, uh, you did say that you had um, additional tests to test if that, if if that solution is not creating any kind of loss of information, so uh, would you give me uh, because I've I've included the the solution in this proposal? Would you give me some more uh, pointers so that I can maybe test the efficiency of the solution more, or would sure. you recommend me to uh, look for another solution, maybe some kind of an argument matcher, which basically uh, a class which matches the argument, uh, like we have a clone command initially, and then we check if that if we have the same clone command. If you have the same clone command, then we would avoid the second fetch. If if that's not the case, maybe we do something else. The, something the, in I had something. Yeah. I am happy to share the 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 things that I created to to do my te initial testing, and it's not completed. But my initial, the thing I created to do my initial testing was more about me doing interactive testing, not doing automated testing. I have a, 
a strong personal bias towards first explore something interactively and then I'll express it as mm -hmm. automation. And, but I'm happy to share the automation, the, the setup that I use to do my interactive testing because it's just a Docker image and I'll, I'll happily, I'll post where that is in the, in the Gitter channel so that you've got, you can see it, you can see how I do it. It is, it is a public GitHub repository that I use that defines a full and complete Jenkins with a number of interesting jobs in it. And some of those jobs are exactly to test for this case. And so I can, okay. I'll, I'll post that in the Gitter channel. That's, that's a very good one where saying, hey, look, here, are, here is this job, this job, and this job that can, can be used as checks for that specific, uh, the double fetch. Okay, sure. Yeah, I, I, I'd love to see that Docker image. Okay, I think the last thing I would I would want to ask is, I think it's seven thirty. Uh, it's about. So. Yeah. So uh, I also wrote a bench micro benchmark test for uh, for the solution I implemented for this redundant fetch, and uh, when so I had two baseline tests where I had one test which had a narrow respect and then i tested gif uh, git i i had two git fetch basically i had two git fetches in that of, uh, in that test and and one with narrow respect one with wide respect so and after that i removed one git fetch to basically show that if we just have one git fetch with a narrow respect and with a wide respect and then compare those four tests to see if there's there's a reasonable increase in the performance when we remove one git fetch. So what I found out was that for the, for three of the rep repositories I chose, which are, uh, which are basically the order of size 4 KB, 4 MB, and then uh, I think the last one is 40 MB or 50 MB. For, for those three repositories, uh, when I, when I used, when I removed the, the, dub, the second git fetch, there was always there was uh, the time the execution time was 50, it reduced by 50 percent almost and I uh, so I was I was a little apprehensive if that would it would that actually happen because I initially when I was looking at the issue I thought okay if I just remove one git fetch I would have I would improve the performance uh, in the order in twice basically in, in, in the order of uh, but I don't understand is, is this correct I the, correct correct is correct is a hard thing to say, but is it what you observed? Yes. Is it believable to me? Yes. So so yeah, but uh, okay. But one thing I did notice as well was for for the large repository uh, of the order of three twenty four MB, uh, the test did not give me a very remarkable dis difference between all the four tests. They did not give me a re remarkable difference, which was a little uh, confusing to me because it should, I think this should not depend on the size of repository if I'm removing one git fetch. Oh, no, no, it very much does re depend on the size of the repository. Oh, it is, it does. It, it should anyway. So, so I'm not sure I'm reading your graph correctly. So on the graph, is it that the, is the group of four bars Maybe uh, okay. zoom, the, zoom, cl zoom closer so I can see what the, the axis. Uh, sure. Sure. Or just describe it. You don't have to zoom in even. Just, just go ahead and describe. Yeah, so the bars are basically the repositories I used. Okay, so, different so, repositories. so and, and each of the groupings is whether there is a redundant fetch or not? Yeah. The first two tests include double fetches and the last two tests they, they they don't have the redundant fetch. Well, wait a sec. Okay, so let's, so the the topmost the topmost rows are without the double fetch, and the bottommost yeah. rows are no, no, with no, no, the no. double. No. I'll, I'll I'll give an example. So for the first test, which is known as a benchmark baseline with narrow respect, it has uh, both the git fetches, and uh, for the first repository, which was of four KB, it it. And the execution time was 79 milliseconds per operation, the average. And uh, for for the same uh, for the same thing, when by when I honor ref spec and I used a narrow ref spec for that, 
and I have I have removed one uh, git fetch. So I have a redundant. I've removed the redundant git fetch. I I saw the average execution time to be 162 milliseconds per operation. Okay, so I think I uh, I am confused myself here. It's the I think it's the reverse. It's the reverse. Yes, those the first two tests they don't have the uh, the second git fetch. They just have one git fetch command, and the last two tests they have both the git fetch commands. That is what is happening because of course the time is increased, so both of those tests would have both git fetches. Got it. Okay. So and and so yeah. what that the way I'm interpreting the data is that the topmost group of four and the second most group of four are probably both without a redundant fetch. Where and then the next group of four and the bottom most group of four is are both with a redundant fetch. Yes. Okay. And yes. and I'm I can't ex I, I am I would have expected the results that are shown for the tiny, small, and medium-sized repositories. Let's call those the the dark blue, less blue, a little bit less blue, but not the green one. Yes. Those those results yes. those seem expected, but of course they're they're sizes of repositories that aren't aren't the example for this particular right forty megabyte repository. Okay, that's getting interesting, and I can't explain why the the removal of the redundant fetches did not dramatically improve the oh no no wait a sec i sure can yes right of course because well, maybe Let, let's let's try this Let, let's let's discuss so fetching a 40 a 40 megabyte repository is probably dominated by data transfer on the first fetch by data transfer of the objects right it's getting 40 yes, megabytes yes. of data so it yes. may be that we need to have you tune this this benchmark to say because most fetches into jenkins git, git workspaces are not the first populated this is the this is the populated case right this is yes, starting exactly. from an empty directory fill it up and and that is a yes. that is an interesting case but it's not the 90% case, 90% of the cases, or 50% at least, are okay. incrementally bringing new changes into an existing workspace. Okay. And so this is, and so that may be something you need to consider in your in your proposal is add the additional attribute of first fetch versus update an existing existing workspace. Okay, sure. Sure, I, I'll do that. I'll and change that. Okay. Great. Yeah, so I think this is a is the questions I had. Thank you for all right. Well thank them. you. We have we have run out of time, Sumit. I didn't ask you for any questions. Are there any questions you wanted to ask Sumit before we close? Actually I was just an observer because uh, I have another project that I'm right now focusing on, but you know, uh, in this gathering knowledge because who knows something just might click for me, you know. So great. I will just do that. All right. Well, thanks, everyone. I'm going to end the recording. I will upload the recording to the Jenkins YouTube channel and post a link to that recording to the Gitter chat. Thanks very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.